fängt man richtig zu streiten erst an. Denn die Baten, die haben dort eine Schan. Part 1. Human Action Chapter 1. Acting Man 1. Purposeful Action and Animal Reaction Human action is purposeful behavior. Or, we may say, action is will put into operation and transformed into an agency, is aiming at ends and goals, is the ego's meaningful response to stimuli and to the conditions of its environment, is a person's conscious adjustment to the state of the universe that determines his life. Such paraphrases may clarify the definition given and prevent possible misinterpretations, but the definition itself is adequate and does not need complement or commentary. Conscious or purposeful behavior is in sharp contrast to unconscious behavior, that is, the reflexes and the involuntary responses of the body's cells and nerves to stimuli. People are sometimes prepared to believe that the boundaries between conscious behavior and the involuntary reaction of the forces operating within man's body are more or less indefinite. This is correct only as far as it is sometimes not easy to establish whether concrete behavior is to be considered voluntary or involuntary. But the distinction between consciousness and unconsciousness is nonetheless sharp and can be clearly determined. The unconscious behavior of the bodily organs and cells is for the acting ego no less a datum than any other fact of the external world. Acting man must take into account all that goes on within his own body, as well as other data, for example, the weather or the attitudes of his neighbors. There is, of course, a margin within which purposeful behavior has the power to neutralize the working of bodily factors. It is feasible, within certain limits, to get the body under control. Man can sometimes succeed through the power of his will in overcoming sickness, in compensating for the innate or acquired insufficiency of his physical constitution, or in suppressing reflexes. As far as this is possible, the field of purposeful action is extended. If a man abstains from controlling the involuntary reaction of cells and nerve centers, although he would be in a position to do so, his behavior is, from our point of view, purposeful. The field of our science is human action, not the psychological events which result in an action. It is precisely this which distinguishes the general theory of human action, praxeology, from psychology. The theme of psychology is the internal events that result or can result in a definite action. The theme of praxeology is action as such. This also settles the relation of praxeology to the psychoanalytical concept of the subconscious. Psychoanalysis, too, is psychology and does not investigate action, but the forces and factors that impel a man toward a definite action. The psychoanalytical subconscious is a psychological and not a praxeological category. Whether an action stems from clear deliberation or from forgotten memories and suppressed desires, which from submerged regions, as it were, direct the will, does not influence the nature of the action. The murderer, whom a subconscious urge, the id, drives toward his crime, and the neurotic, whose aberrant behavior seems to be simply meaningless to an untrained observer, both act. They, like anybody else, are aiming at certain ends. It is the merit of psychoanalysis that it has demonstrated that even the behavior of neurotics and psychopaths is meaningful, that they, too, act and aim at ends. Although we who consider ourselves normal and sane call the reasoning determining their choice of ends nonsensical, and the means they choose for the attainment of these ends contrary to purpose. 
The term unconscious, as used by praxeology, and the term subconscious, as applied by psychoanalysis, belong to two different systems of thought and research. Praxeology, no less than other branches of knowledge, owes much to psychoanalysis. The more necessary is it, then, to become aware of the line which separates praxeology from psychoanalysis. Action is not simply giving preference. Man also shows preference in situations in which things and events are unavoidable, or are believed to be so. Thus a man may prefer sunshine to rain, and may wish that the sun would dispel the clouds. He who only wishes and hopes does not interfere actively with the course of events, and with the shaping of his own destiny. But acting man chooses, determines, and tries to reach an end. Of two things, both of which he cannot have together, he selects one and gives up the other. Action, therefore, always involves both taking and renunciation. To express wishes and hopes, and to announce planned action, may be forms of action insofar as they aim in themselves at the realization of a certain purpose. But they must not be confused with the actions to which they refer. They are not identical with the actions they announce, recommend, or reject. Action is a real thing. What counts is a man's total behavior, and not his talk about planned but not realized acts. On the other hand, action must be clearly distinguished from the application of labor. Action means the employment of means for the attainment of ends. As a rule, one of the means employed is the acting man's labor, but this is not always the case. Under special conditions, a word is all that is needed. He who gives orders or interdictions may act without any expenditure of labor. To talk or not to talk, to smile or to remain serious, may be action. To consume and to enjoy are no less action than to abstain from accessible consumption and enjoyment. Praxeology consequently does not distinguish between active or energetic and passive or indolent man. The vigorous man, industriously striving for the improvement of his condition, acts neither more nor less than the lethargic man, who sluggishly takes things as they come. For to do nothing and to be idle are also action. They, too, determine the course of events. Wherever the conditions for human interference are present, man acts no matter whether he interferes or refrains from interfering. He who endures what he could change acts no less than he who interferes in order to attain another result. A man who abstains from influencing the operation of physiological and instinctive factors which he could influence also acts. Action is not only doing, but no less omitting to do what possibly could be done. We may say that action is the manifestation of a man's will, but this would not add anything to our knowledge, for the term will means nothing else than man's faculty to choose between different states of affairs, to prefer one, to set aside the other, and to behave according to the decision made in aiming at the chosen state and forsaking the other. <laughs>